Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the TECOM annual conference. We are very pleased to share this experience with you, the community and the TECOM members. Thank you for joining us today. To give you the opportunity to interact with each other after each presentation and to exchange ideas, please use the text chat or visit the TECOM Café after this presentation. My name is Birgitta Nix. I work at KU Leuven University and I'm also the delegate of TECOM Belgium. And I'm very happy to be your moderator for this session. We also have a support team of TECOM staff members in the background. They will make sure that everything, everything runs smoothly, technically speaking. Before we begin, I encourage you to ask any questions that you may have during the presentation in the chat that you will see in the control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during uh, the presentation. We will collect them and our speakers are happy to deal with them in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Also, should you experience any technical problems or cannot hear the speakers well, please let us know via the chat function. Our speakers here today gave a great presentation together at TC World Conference last year. Their visual and compelling presentation style was well received and they are excited to be back with another co-production. And we are excited too to hear them talk about Don't Be Fooled, Dark Patterns and Ethical Design. Welcome and thank you for being here with us, Leonie Saremba from Parson AG and Anton Bollen from TechSmith Corporation. The floor is all yours. Thank you um, for this nice introduction. Um, let me check, you can see my screen. So hi everybody. Unfortunately, I have to turn off my camera as I'm running into some technical issues here. Um, well, let me check. So, yes, my name is Leonie Zaremba. Um, I'm very excited to be back together with Anton Bollen from TechSmith um, for this presentation, Don't Be Fooled, Dark Patterns and Ethical Design. So I'm a technical communicator and somehow this job title evolved some aliases. Let's say there are the technical writers, the UX, um, the UX writers, but there are also user assistance developers, um, content designers, you name it. Um, they all differ somehow in their main focus, but they have one thing in common. And this is simply to provide information that best fit the user's needs. So yes, in this presentation, we will talk about user experience and design. But what is ethical design? Well, there's not the one fits all definition for it, in my opinion. So I'd like to share an interesting approach that I found at the ethical design manifesto that comes along with the pyramid. Let me check how to switch my slides. It's not the easiest. So we have this pyramid. And this pyramid basically is all about respect. At the base layer, we have respect for the human rights. Um, building on that, we respect human effort. And this will all result somehow in the respect of the human experience. Um, yeah, basically meaning you have to build those layers to really achieve the next layer. Of course, this is the ideal picture of ethical design. If you have a closer look, um, for example, respecting human rights is really providing technology that is accessible, secure, sustainable, and so on. For existing technology, you may find some points that still can be improved. Building on that, respecting human efforts is like offering a design that is functional, convenient, and reliable. And all of this will result in a delightful experience with the design technology. So keep this in mind when we speak about ethical design and somehow this will make sense. But is this really a thing, you might wonder? 
And um, we can see, for example, here, The Guardian offers a podcast that is titled Dark Patterns, the Art of Online Deception. Um, sounds a bit mysterious. Let's have a closer look here at the New York Times. Um, it publishes basically an opinion called Stopping the Manipulation Machines. Still sounds a bit mysterious. The verge becomes a bit more specific. California bans dark patterns that trick users into giving away their personal data. And let me assure you, this is not only a thing in California, this is also a, a thing in, in Germany, so legislation really has to prepare for those dark patterns. But what are dark patterns? So in this presentation, I'd like to um, yeah, simply introduce you into certain types of dark patterns. Keep in mind there are a lot of them out there, so you can find even more. Some of them mix certain meanings, but basically I just want to show you the essential ones. Um, and I think some of you might have already experienced the one or other type of it. So I found this definition, dark patterns are tricks used in websites and apps that make you do things that you didn't mean to. This is a quote by Harry Brignall, the founder of Dark Patterns Org. And I highly recommend visiting this website because it really creates awareness around this topic. And it also shames companies using too much of those dark patterns. Now let's get to the types of them. We start with trick questions. Um, using unfamiliar or yeah, uncommon phrasing patterns already tricks users into doing things they don't want to. Have a look at this one. You can tick, I agree, I don't disagree, I don't not agree. This is highly confusing, but there is the possibility that you just see I don't, and as you're used to opt in, you simply assume, as it is following, I agree, it is the opposite, but basically it's not. Have a look at this example. We'd love to send you emails with our offers and products, but if you do not wish these updates, please tick this box. In most cases, we are used to have a page that is designed to opt in. Here, you clearly have to opt out. You just see we love to send you emails and you assume you don't want it and you don't tick this box. This is how it works. So let's have a look at the next one. Sneak into basket. And this um, applies to online shopping. So imagine you just want to order a bit of protein powder because you're living the healthy lifestyle. And once you clicked on it and added it to your shopping cart, a shaker sneaked into your basket. Is this sustainable? Is this really convenient? Is it reliable as there's the next item in your shopping cart? Um, yeah, so this is how something sneaks into your basket. Let's talk about misdirection. Um, I assume almost each and every one of us has been here, somehow accepting a cookie banner and maybe you have already sold your data soul. So this is really using certain uh, visualization uh, methods just to trick you into I accept because it seems like there's only one option to proceed your doings on a website or application, here in this case a website. Confirm shaming. Um, this is fun or not. So as we're talking about shame, I have a confession to make. I am a Netflix addict and I've been so many series and documentaries. Um, that having access to another streaming provider would probably ruin my relations to human beings. So in those very rare cases where I have to order um, items on Amazon, guess what happens? I am being confirmed shamed into not gaining those Amazon Prime benefits as I know I have to pay attention I really do, as you might see, here's also misdirection and kind of providing just one button um, to use it now and pay after for Prime. But to the left, there you see continue and don't gain Amazon Prime benefits. Continuing with the last type of dark patterns, it's called Roach Motel. And this is a bigger story. So um, 
let's let's just jump right into it um, i found this example on darkpatterns.org but i guess it's a perfect example to basically say you get into situations very very easily but it's tremendously hard to get out of them so imagine you want to go to a concert you visit a website to order your tickets online you put them into your basket you kind of agree to the terms and conditions as, as usual. You finalize your purchase, but somehow a subscription sneaked into your basket and you didn't, you didn't uh, see this coming. So now, as you are the proud owner of a subscription, how can you get rid of it? So this example is a bit older, but let's just have a look. You have to download a form. You have to print it out. You have to fill it out with a pen. You have to put it into an envelope. You have to put the stamp on it and you have to send it via mail. So hopefully you made it in the perfect period of time and you got rid of the subscription. Otherwise you may be kept in there for the next six months. Um, so keep this in mind when really agreeing to terms and conditions and all the the, the, those options the website is offering, pay attention to those details as yeah, you have seen there might be a long way coming to get out of situations. Now you can argue, are we talking about psycho tips or tricks? I'd like to talk a bit about perception. Basically last year we had uh, another presentation that really was just showing you how your brain actually um, reacts very naturally um, when you look at certain types of visualizations. If you're interested, it's still available on YouTube here. I just want to show you that there are natural processes in your brain, in your psychology that are triggered when I show you certain visualizations. And so let me just try to be, or to guide your focus. We have those randomly placed white circles on dark slide backgrounds. And as I continue uh, talking, <laughs> um, your brain kind of, um, yeah, gets to the point where there's no further information to process than just having those randomly placed white circles. This is exactly the state I want to work with because as soon as I change something, you perceive the additional information about the grouping to the left. But I can still continue. You will focus on this colored circle and you will also follow this colored focus. It also works in sizes. And as soon as I connect those objects next to it, they are also perceived as one object taking really a lot of space. Now, looking longer at this slide, you will then end up in having three main parts, the grouping to the left, the big circle in the middle and the connected circles to the right. So that was quite easy, but I, I achieved this task and to, to convince your focus to follow my lead just because I know what happens in your brain when you look at it. Keep in mind that designers also do know those tricks. But there's another uh, psychological topic I'd like to talk about, and it's called the fear of missing out, in short, FOMO. So a lot of us um, grew up in a very capitalist <laughs> society. So we are very, we have a very um, natural pattern of consuming things. And we consume a lot of things and advertisement is spamming us with information we always we constantly want to renew to update and so on so you can benefit from this fear of missing out in your designs how oh, let's imagine you want to go to another concert here for example elton john offering one ticket for 192 euros and as you may not have noticed it yet once you um you, you, you have chosen your ticket, a countdown is running, really pressuring you into finalizing your purchase. So you better don't think twice <laughs> to um, spend so much money on Elton John. You better put it into your basket because it could be after um, the countdown is done that you may never get those tickets again. And it even becomes better because uh, once you hit the five minute mark, 
It even becomes red, signalizing even more importance, trying to pressure you into finalizing the purchase. Um, it does also exist in other ways. Here, for example, a sale of a T-shirt. And if we focus to the right of this uh, side, one, once you've chosen your size, um, you can see a warning like only one piece left in your size. So again, trying to pressurize you into finalizing your purchase as soon as possible. Um, this was quite specific. So here in this case, once you have chosen your size, um, there's the text string only a few left exclamation mark. So even those tiny details again pressure you into finalizing the purchase. Um, so, yeah, be aware of how tiny those de details can be trying to influence you into yeah, doing things you may not want to or not in the time frame that you assumed. So, when talking about psycho tips or tricks, basically, yes, it is manipulation, but it can be done in a good way or in a bad way. And let's uh, see for ourselves. Um, we have a video here and we are lucky to share it with you because this was a meeting really happening. And Eric, UX leader, TechSmith, will tell you um, what his perspective on point of view is in this topic. So now we can play the video, please. We all know the things that will help people slide through things that they're not going to do. It's almost like um, we're wizards and we know where the dark magic is. We had to learn it in order, like we had to learn how people react to colors, patterns, workflows, et cetera. That's, that's what we're studying. We've learned the psychology of color and all of these things that are all leading to, this is why I picked this button, <laughs> or this is why the dialogue is laid out in this way. There is a fair amount of psychology built into the profession. And it's like, no, you have to know it, but not, not go there, <laughs> to be encouraged not to go there and to be practiced in not going there. Okay, seems like this worked out. I'm sharing my screen again. So, in my opinion, this pretty much nailed it. You have to be practiced in not going there. And this is where the role of UX writing comes in. Um, so considering that maybe not each and every one of us started their careers uh, with a university degree in UX writing, let's uh, define what is UX writing actually. And I found... Uh, Excuse me, may I shortly interrupt you, Leonie? Yeah. Uh, um, I d I'm not sure whether everyone was able to um, hear the video well. Did oh. you all have sound? I had sound on my end. This is Anton, came through on this. I also had sound. Too. Yeah, okay, then there will be. Yeah, no problem, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry for interrupting you. Oh, fine. It's a new slide. Okay. So, what is UX writing? I found a definition on uxwritinghub.com and it really distinguishes the UX writers from technical writers. So, let's have a look. UX writers work specifically with digital interfaces. A big part of the job is to research, create and test user flows and microcopy. So, creating those microcopies, you put meaning onto um, um, buttons, for example, that trigger certain actions. Um, but you also create context information to really enable an intuitive um, yeah, page navigation or navigation through an application. Um, but keep in mind, um, as you as 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 you need those your eyes to really put your texts on it and as there can't be any any user flows without a concept you and your microcopy you are essentially contributing to the whole ux design process and this is <laughs> where 
where I really want to emphasize on claim this responsibility in the UX design process, because as you've seen, there are tiny details on screen that really make a huge difference in the ethical design of a technology. So this is where I hand over to Anton. And Anton is going to show you his perspective, how TechSmith is handling this topic of dark design, um, how they deal with dark patterns, and yeah, basically the whole UX design process at TechSmith. So I'm very excited. Anton, you can take over now. Is this possible? Why, yes, of course, it's possible, Leonie, and uh, hello to you. I think you can now see me and you can hear me, and hello also to this wonderful audience that we have today. Thank you for joining us uh, yeah, on this wonderful Thursday morning. Um, I assume we all, as consumers, we don't like dark patterns, right? We don't like to be tricked. We don't like to be manipulated. We expect honesty and we want to be treated well, and yet we face questionable situations in our day-to-day -day life almost every single day. So why is that? Do companies simply not care? Well, I don't know if companies care or if they don't, but I do know that they should. And here's why, right? Acting ethically actually helps your business. So there recently was this big survey by the Qualtrics XM Institute where they interviewed 17,000 participants from I believe 18 countries about what they value most when selecting a company to do business with, okay? And the responses are really interesting and the top response is the company has a great product or service. And that makes sense, right? We're driven by quality and we wanna buy something or do business with someone who can give us quality. But the second highest response is a company that treats you well. So. A company that treats you well, that can mean lots of different things based on your audience, your products, your industry, and your market. But nevertheless, right, any manipulation, manipulation or lack of respect towards your customers, including the use of dark uh, patterns, will most certainly negatively impact the way a company is perceived and whether or not people choose to do business with that company. So yes, I do think ethics matter for people, but also for businesses. So yeah, hi again. Uh, my name is Anton Bollen um, and I work for an American software company called TechSmith. And just to be clear, I'm not a UX writer, I'm not a UX designer, I'm not a tech writer, no. I'm actually a customer success specialist and trainer. And I'm here because I care a lot about ethical design. And that's why I want to use the company I work for, TechSmith, to show all of you a real-world example of how a UX team might work with the overall design process, how a microcopy is created, and of course, take a look at some of our own designs and discuss with you whether they're ethical or dark and see if that's okay. All right, let's go. So we at TechSmith, we have two major products, Snagit and Camtasia. I'm not gonna go into those products today. If that interests you, come find me afterwards, right? Um, let's focus on the U UX experience. And for the UX experience, each product has its own experience team. The team consists usually of a UX lead, as well as normally five designers, who are or UX designers, who are assigned to different parts of the user and product journey. So some of them, usually two or three, work on the product itself, so on the software and the workflows within the software. One person is focused on the associated cloud and storage services. One person is taking care of the website and the marketing material and experience. And last but not least, uh, each team also has a UX researcher who does, well, research and who prepares insights and gets the team ready. And then we also have several tech writers and instructional designers, among other people, who are also involved in the process and who work really closely with them. Um, and these teams, they work across the entire user and product journey. And their job is basically what Leonie said just uh, two or three minutes ago, right? They work specifically with digital interfaces. So in our case, that's our software. And a big part of their job is to research, create, and test user flows and microcopy. Right. So speaking of microcopy, who writes microcopy at TechSmith? It's not me. 
it's that much is clear, right? Um, well, in our case, it's usually the UX writers and they collaborate with the tech writers to do so. We don't have a clear line on when or where it's being done. However, it's really based on what the situation, the dialogue, the workflow is. But you'll see in a second, the teams are pretty integrated. And as a result of that, they can often actually collaborate on the microcopy and making sure it's, yeah, they're writing it together. And in a few cases, we've had situations where maybe a developer or someone from marketing, and hey, sometimes even me, might write a piece of microcopy. But that's not ideal. We, as a company, we try to have all text go through UX and tech writing because they're the masters of text and they know much better what the voice, the style, and the ethics of the company are. Well, now that you roughly see how our team is a little bit set up and how they write some of that text, I do want to talk a little bit more about how they cooperate with other departments. Because the thing is, our designers, or our UX designers, and our tech writers are actually integrated into the product development and design process. They, that means they attend those shared meetings to make sure they get the information they actually need um, early on, and they can provide input and re revisions as well. <clears throat> and there's also a lot of collaboration on a larger scale, but also within the teams. So for example, a lot of the tech writers have the tendency to attend the UX design meetings, again, making sure they're getting the information they need, they're able to provide input, and all of that encourages you know, awareness, transparency, conversation, and also so trust, right? Trust to your team members, the other people you're working with, and that is super important in anywhere, really, right? And also having, as we can see here, right, a mix of different job roles and experiences at the table can actually greatly benefit the overall UX and product design process because, you know, I was told there was many times where maybe a UX design felt pretty close to finish only to have one of the tech writers take a look at it and with their own unique um, perspective, you know, notice a previously unknown problem, they were able to call it out and then get it fixed. And so having this additional perspective on any of that, these designs and processes helps, well, helps the product, helps the company and helps your team. All right, so what is it that we do at TechSmith? Well, we try to make useful software and a big part of making, um, uh, useful software is of course to make the software usable and that's where our UX team comes in, Eric and his entire bunch. And um, to put it into the words of Jesse, one of our other UX leads, um, most of our work is within our software products so we can focus on usefulness. So what that means is that the team you know, can focus on creating useful microcopy and workflows within our software to help our users accomplish tasks well, within the software. Um, and let me just show you one example of what that looks like, right? So as you can see here in this little animation, clicking, dragging, and holding is a pretty common workflow in our software Contagia, but also lots of other software out there. And to uh, in this example, it is, for example, used to take an effect and apply it to a clip on the bottom of the timeline in this project. And to help guide the user, the UX team implemented a really nice little color change. Take a look. So once you start dragging one of those effects, you should notice that the clips on the timeline all of a sudden turn blue. And this is to indicate to the user that the effect they just grabbed from the top can now be placed to any of the clips highlighted in blue on the bottom. It's a nice little visual change that first draws in the attention of the user, and then it signals to them as to where to place the effect next. Right? And further, if you take a look at the animation just one more time, once the drag clip actually reaches one of the clips on the bottom, the clip will change color one more time to green to further indicate that the effect can now be placed. And now these little color changes, they might seem insignificant and small, but trust me, they truly help the user. And they further help the user because it's consistent throughout our application. So here's another example, same idea. You're selecting a different type of effect and based on which effect you're selecting, different clips on the timeline will be highlighted. Once again, driving and indicating to the user what they can do or what their next action and option could be. And this, all of this consistency and these changes, right? they help the user consciously but also subconsciously learn and use our software. And that's a lot of what UX is really about. Oh, that's my mouse, here's my mouse, hello mouse. So, but you know what? You see these? Those are our, well, I have them right here, right? Those are our lights and we like to keep them on. And our employees, we like to get paid at the end of the month. And as a company, we do want to invest more money into new products 
research equipment equipment and also just generally staying competitive and all of that requires money and we therefore we can't just make software but we also have to be good and focus on selling software that's just the name of the game right and whenever you talk sales and revenue at a company you quickly have lots of different stakeholders and perspectives come to the table and to the conversation um, so as a company we of course want to convert trial users to paying customers uh, marketing might want more data so they can optimize the ads they are delivering. Uh, sales, of course, wants pre-qualified leads. Um, any information we can gather about the users helps us to provide maybe more personalized and customized onboarding experiences. There are laws and technology limitations that need to be factored in and, and, and. So you can see there's a lot of things to take into account and there will need to be conversations around which approach or workflow to take. And honestly, you will likely or your team will likely need to find compromises as the time comes um, because you will need to find or you will need to balance all those interests goals and expectations and turn them into appropriate and hopefully ethical business practices now we at TechSmith are in the lucky position that we have really good software that we can sell and that in my opinion actually makes it a lot easier for a company to be ethical right we don't have to trick our users. Our business is not based on manipulation. So we have a bit of a clear advantage when it comes to this stuff. And yet, we've had in the past, and we still do today, have some elements of dark patterns throughout our different experiences. And I think it is worth for us all now to take a look at some of these examples, see what they are, how they came about, how they were perceived, and also you know, how we reacted to them. All right, let's go. But first, a sip of coffee. Ah, perfect. All right, so let's start with one that's a couple years old, and actually I think it's quite embarrassing, to be honest, and it's a roach motel, right? Remember, making it unnecessarily difficult for the user to cancel or opt out, out of a subscription or something they, they signed up for. And in our case, right, it was possible for the user to sign up to an online account uh, for our cloud offering, screencast.com, right? They were able to subscribe to it online. However, once subscribed, it was not possible to unsubscribe online. They actually had to call us or email us in order to unsubscribe. And that, yeah, is simply not cool and also makes that whole experience less user-friendly. And the thing is, we didn't really do it intentional, right? It was not this big plan to make it hard for the user to opt out so we can keep more of their hard-earned money. No, honestly, we just hadn't gotten around technically to adding that button yet. It was a technical oversight. Um, yeah. We just hadn't really done it yet and then it kind of slipped off the radar and yeah that's why it's also a bit embarrassing um but whatever the reason or the excuse for why it's not there the fact is um it increased the amount of support calls we got and also it left a pretty bad impression on our new users who just signed up to our services and that's not something we want to do or want to believe in as a company and so fortunately we realized that this was an issue and then pretty quickly after we realized that issue, we went in, we added a cancel option to the account settings and now everything is as the client and the company would expect. So all's good now, but still, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a dark spot in our history. All right, moving on. Um, converting trial users, right? People test the software to paying customers. That's a big part of our business. And as I said, we make software and we do offer a trial version of our software. We always have usually for 15 or 30 days. And as you might expect with any trial software, it has this nice little welcome, enjoy your trial dialogue, as you can see right here on the screen. And the purpose of this dialogue is to three things, right? It's to inform the user how many days are left in their trial. Uh, the second thing is to allow the user to uh, purchase the software right then and there. And the third one is we, uh, if they have a valid license, they can enter a software key and unlock the full version. So far, so good. And we've had this dialogue for a long, long time. And then we changed it and we wanted to emphasize two things. Well, first up, let me show you the new dialogue. Here we go. First up, we really wanted to encourage the trial users to purchase and we wanted to make that easy for them. The second thing is we wanted to make it easier for those people who have a license key to unlock the software. So as a result of those two needs, we redesigned the dialogue and yeah, the two options, buy and unlock, are nice and big and clean and clear and in your face. And you can see them right then and there. So mission accomplished? Well, I don't know, because the third option, continue trial, um, 
got incredibly, oh, here we go, uh, de-emphasized throughout this process. Like, take a look at the screen. Have you found that option yet? Like, it's in the bottom right, kind of like a low contrast text. Um, and that is definitely a clear case of misdirection, if you think back at what Leonie said earlier, right? And guess what? Misdirection is no good. We had legitimate users call us who wanted to test our software, telling us, hey, I can't figure out how to start your test or your software test. And that is not good because you know what? People don't usually buy software because you put a big buy button in their face. They buy software when they see value. And in our case, most of our users need to test and try out the software in order to see and realize that value. So, um, Having a trial dialogue that makes it uncomplicated, difficult for the user to even test our software is in our case just not smart, right? So fortunately, we realized that this was an issue, Whew. right? And we went back to the table and we had more internal conversations with those different stakeholders about what are we trying to accomplish with this dialogue? Is it in line with our company goals? What effects are we having? How are our customers currently perceiving it? And honestly, having these conversations and this reflection and allowing yourself or your company to take a step back, look at things and then improve or change things are incredibly important. And I'm really happy I work for a company where this is pretty common culture to go back and reflect and improve. And because our team was able to do that and they were looking at, you know, after, the, after they had implemented that dialogue, they saw the overall experience, um, they had the conversation, they made some real realizations and yeah, they changed the software dialogue once more to make it easier for the trial users to access the trial, which is more ethical, but also better for our business. So trial conversions are still important to us today, right? They keep those famous lights on that I have here. And I wanna talk real quick about how we handle those today in the year 2021 and going forward. And there are two aspects to it, right? The first one is we require now a sign-in that's pretty standard in the industry. It has advantages and disadvantages. We'll save that for another day. The one I wanna talk about now is the other one. It's a watermark because every single video that is produced during that trial period by a testing user has a watermark added to it to limit its use. Um, and we've gotten pushback from clients, or less clients, really customers or evaluating customers that this watermark is unethical and not cool and disruptive. But, you know, I actually think it's pretty fair. Um, and hear me out, right? So the user still, it's a trial version, right? And the user still gets to test the fully functional version of that software. And they get free support and they can even keep their work if they purchase at the end. And that seems pretty fair of considering that it's a trial version, right? And we don't limit the software beyond the simple watermark, which is only there to limit abuse. Yeah, and what, I think is most important here is not the watermark, but that we're being very transparent about this. The user is informed that this watermark is gonna be added before they even start the trial. When they first sign up right here on the dialog, we can all see. And then it's communicated throughout the software at critical or strategic points as well, whenever the topic of production comes up. Um, and of course, yeah, so we are being very transparent about it. We're very clear about it. And of course, we also encourage our users we still have that big buy now button in the middle of the screen because we do want to sell software and we do want to make that step easy on, this, on the user. But I think all of that is you know, in the scope of conducting ethical business and balancing those interests um, as it's done in a clean, transparent, and most importantly, non-manipulative non -manipulative way. Okay, let's look at, um, if we got a few more minutes, let's look at one more example, right? Sneak into basket when you currently purchase our software um right um <clears throat> sorry, sorry when you currently purchase our software it already includes a one-year maintenance contract and we offer an automatic billing option and this billing option is enabled by default and unless the user unchecks this option uh, they will be automatically charged next year for another year of maintenance so is it okay to do that well it's definitely in the interest of our business um but is it okay or is it a bit of an evil ploy to get you know our users to subscribe to something they don't want? Well, let's think about it. So first up, 
I know from just our customers that most of them actually prefer to have the subscription to maintenance auto renew, so they always get the latest version and those additional benefits. So one could argue that it's actually in the interest to have this option enabled by default because that it is what the majority of our users actually prefer to have. But further, um, this option that this is automatic billing is clearly communicated, and that's the other important piece here, right? It's right here on the buy screen, black on right before you purchase. Um, it's not hidden in the fine print of the terms and conditions. It doesn't show up after the purchase. No, you know what you're getting before you buy. And thirdly, or thirdly, third, um, <clears throat> it's completely optional, right? The user can uncheck this option right here if they want during the buy process, or they can just get in touch with us at any point after the purchase and unsubscribe as well, and there's no penalty or anything like that. So all of that is, again, transparent and clean and yeah, open. Um, and you could still argue, yeah, right, that having this option enabled by default is a type of dark pattern, and I'm not necessarily going to argue against that. But I think it's important for us to take a step back and look at the overall experience and the overall factors that went into play and how the final output then looked and how that experience was designed. So let's do one more, and I want to end on a friendly one, right? Um, so you remember the video earlier from my colleague Eric. Right? And he said something along the lines, even if not all of you were able to see it, we are all magicians. We all know the dark magic. We all know how all that stuff works and how users are being manipulated or guided. However, it is our job to use these powers for good. And so I love it when our UX team does really cool stuff. And one little psycho trip, psycho trick they used was in the Snagit onboarding dialogues right here. It's like in product uh, onboarding tips. And um, they included elements of gamification and FOMO. So if you're looking at this tip right here in that little animation, I hope you can see that. Okay. You, um, it'll, it'll circle back to that in just a second. Here we go. It's a, it's a bunch of, it's a checklist which intuitively encourages the user to click on the next option and discover all the different tips and tricks, almost like a game, right? There's something in all of us that want to make sure we check all those boxes and get all those five stars. And that's that gamification coming in and then on the other hand i also feel whenever there's a list and there's some things that are not checked off it also makes makes me a bit uneasy because i might feel like hey maybe there are some tips and tricks i'm missing out on maybe this software can do so much more for me that i didn't know and so as a result i fear that i may be missing out on parts of that software or being knowing some cool workflow and that is fomo the fear of missing out and those little psycho trick help the user to check out the tips discover the tips explore the tips which helps us, of course, but also really helps the user learn and understand the software. So, and the UX team has been working on some new approaches uh, or some new dialogues like this. So, keep an eye open in the next version of Snagit. Uh, it's coming out next month, actually. Um, we'll have some more cool rework tool tips in there that also take into account a lot of cool UX designs. Okay, so let's finish this up, right? So, what can your I'm looking at you, right? What can your role be in all of this? Well, Leonie and I, we don't really know who you are, what your job title is, what your role is, what your company is like, what your company culture is like. So the experience and opportunity for every single one of you and us will be different. But generally speaking, there are several best practices and things to consider when working with UX design and development teams um, that I would like to uh, show off in a second. And uh, if you do want to encourage and enable ethical design at your company, there's a few things um, you can do as well. So let's take a look. Best practices for working with UX. Well, as a UX designer or a UX writer or a tech writer, you know, you should try to onboard into the design process very early on and stay involved throughout the entire process. Um, this can be done by setting up frequent syncs or attending the meetings, just like our UX team and tech writers are doing. Um, and that helps you get the information that you need. It gives you an opportunity to know from beginning to end what the vision of the product or the feature is. And it gives you an opportunity to provide valuable input as well. And speaking of input, right? Um, you'll also likely have chances to collaborate in research and testing, and that will help you to learn more about how your product is being used, who is using it, why it's being used, what the challenges are, and all of that will allow you to be a better and more valuable contributor to the overall process. Then, if you're collaborating with UX on writing any of the microcopy, 
incorporate your style guide, your writing style guides into the UX style guides. So you're all pulling from the same book. And then last but not least, as with everything in professional life, right? Establish a common process on how your technology will be developed, documented, how you'll be working on it, how you will be testing on it, and how you will be collaborating. So again, you're all on the same page and working effectively and collaboratively together. And now, if you do care about ethical design, there are two more things or a few more things you can also do. And the first one is you can advocate, just like Leonie and I are doing, right? We care about ethical design, which is why we're here today and telling all of you, and we're hoping that it will make you think, reflect, and maybe you'll even tell others about it. Um, and you might also have opportunities at your workplace where you can actually proactively address ethical design, right? If you see something that you don't think is in the interest of the user, or maybe the company interest, right? Start a conversation around it. Ask if it's in the interest of the user. Ask if it's in line with the company goals or the company values. And maybe, maybe, you know, you can suggest alternatives or alternative workflows on how to do it differently that is possibly better and, yeah, more ethical. Because remember, People like to buy from ethical businesses. And most importantly, with everything we all do, right, we should always respect the human using our technology. And with that, I'm going to say thank you. And I'd love to have some questions if you have them. And Leonie, thank you so <laughs> much, Leonie and Anton, yeah, for this wonderful presentation. As uh, someone from the attendees puts it, I very much like the design and the concept of your presentation with clear speech and good infographics. Yeah, so that's so that's great to hear. Nice feedback for you. Yeah, um, we haven't received uh, many questions yet in the chat, but actually we're also running out of time. So should you have any questions, please shoot now. Yeah. <laughs> someone is saying um, thank you for the inputs. Yeah, and I'm sure that uh, Leonie and Anton will be available for further questions. Yeah, um, in the Tecom Cafe right after mm -hmm. this presentation. Yeah, and um, yeah, then you can discuss further. Yeah, on this exciting uh, topic. And please uh, do not forget to evaluate um, this session. Um, yeah, so please you do it program you can just uh, oh here it is yeah even in the presentation just click the qr code and please um yeah evaluate uh, this wonderful presentation so thank you um for the audience for joining us here today uh, and for your lively interaction also in in the chat and uh thank you once more uh, to leonie and to anton yeah and um we hope to see you uh, soon again in another presentation. I wish you a wonderful conference and the remainder of the day. Yeah, see you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.